Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure, as always, to be here today and to continue our collaboration with Lowinger Library and certainly the li uh, Lowinger Library Associates, um, as well as to welcome our distinguished guest from the University of Texas at Austin, Professor Guido Oliveri. Um, I would like to begin my comments by focusing on what I like to describe as the exceptionalism of the 18th century. It was an era in which culture, whether science, literature, philosophy, politics, and the diverse artistic traditions were transformed through an unprecedented acquisition of knowledge. This cultural transformation, which was early on called Les Lumières, or more broadly, the Enlightenment, was devoted to raising general education while confronting superstition, dogma, and prejudice. As Alexander Pope declared in the essay on man, quote, the proper study of mankind is man, close quote. He indelibly located the cultural moment, a movement in humanity itself. Yet the Enlightenment, whose earliest stirrings were in French rationalism and English empiricism, transcended nationality and reached across European borders, even to the shores of the Atlantic colonies. The relative momentary peace in Europe after 1715, coupled to a rising prosperity and this premium placed on knowledge, fueled an increase in international travel. The affluent, educated, and often aristocratic travelers of the North headed south, primarily to Italy. Their collective travels to the Italian peninsula came to be known rather rapidly as the Grand Tour. Indeed, no less than the lexographer, essayist, poet, and moralist, Dr. Samuel Johnson stated the following, quote, a man who has not been in Italy is always conscious of an inferiority from his not having seen what is expected a man should see. The grand object of traveling is to see the shores of the Mediterranean, close quote. Dr. Johnson's reflection captures perfectly the dual nature of this adventure for Europeans, whether British, Austrian, Scandinavian, and even American. The Grand Tour was on one hand didactic, a supplement or more commonly a culmination to formal schooling whose focus was primarily cultural with an increasing emphasis on artistic realms, painting, sculpture, architecture, theater, archeology, span and of course, music. Yet the Grand Tour was inherently and fundamentally about pleasure, to live, to experience, to bear witness in the flesh to what these most fortunate individuals had acquired in their primarily Greek and Latin educations. And then to return with a souvenir, whether of antiquity or a portrait realized in Roman entire or even the most fashionable music in manuscript. Two contemporary paintings illustrate my point vividly. <clears throat> The first is entitled The Tribuna of the Uffizi, painted in the years 1772 to 1778 by the German artist Johann Zoffany. Commissioned by Queen Charlotte, Zoffany had unprecedented access to the museum, especially the Medici collection and even works from the Palazzo Pitti. This entree came from the influence of George Nassau Clavering Cowper, the third Earl Cowper, and Sir Horace Mann, the British Council in Resonance. As equally impressive to the masterworks assembled for the painting are the number of largely British dignitaries included in the portrait. I'll just walk out here and show you that this is indeed the third Earl Cowper. And he and those around him are gazing upon a Madonna by Raphael. This Madonna, now called the Nicolini Cowper Madonna, hangs in the National Gallery here in Washington, D.C. And then over here on the right is Sir Horace Mann, the British Consul. And they are gazing upon Titian's Venus of Orvino. Just looking at the collection, we have another Raphael, San Giovanni Battista, uh, and Raphael, Madonna della Sedia, and then there is the odd Rubens, Perugino, and even a Caravaggio thrown in. So although music does not factor into this painting, it does vividly juxtapose British wealth with the Italian artistic patrimony. 
The next images speak directly to music among the elite classes traveling to Italy. Zoffany once again uh, painted the third Earl Cowper, this time with the Gore family to commemorate uh, Cowper's marriage to Hannah Ann Gore in 1775. Cowper, dressed extravagantly here in the green coat, gazes lovingly upon his bride, who was at least 16 at the time. But what really draws our attention is what's at center here. Music making. Charles Gore, her father, with her sister Emily, as he plays the, the viola da gamba, or, or cello, and looks over her shoulder and reads from the manuscript. And the instrument in itself is very interesting. So this is a forte piano, um, more commonly referred to as a square piano. This is probably the work of Johannes Zumpe. Zumpe was, uh, as you can tell by his north, a German, who relocated to London and manufactured these square pianos in the 1760s. So now the instrument itself becomes an emblem of cultural exchange. In the backdrop, we have this painting um, in which there are three graces, Isis and Hercules, who is scaring away physically calumny. And to the right, the Tuscan countryside where Third Earl Gott Cowper and Hannah Ann Gore would settle in the Villa Palmieri in Fiesole in 1780. Second image, or next image. The artist Pompeo Girolamo Battoni specialized in portraits of English nobility. This is an early work that uh, testifies to the competing themes of erudition and pleasure as well as the role of music. The portrait features John Montague, the first Baron Montague in 1764. Again, music is featured prominently. Under his left arm, we have this sort of richly ornamented mandolin. But is, what is of greater interest is the manuscript he holds in hand and is diligently studying. It is the Opus 5 violin sonatas of Arcangelo Corelli. Corelli, a native to Fusignano, educated in Bologna, but found great fame in Rome working for two cardinals, Pamphili and Ottoboni, as well as Queen Christina, became an international sensation because of his violin sonatas and of course his virtuoso violin playing. So it's through the tour that these manuscripts also circulated and were widely disseminated. For those of you coming to the concert today, you will hear a trio sonata by Corelli on the program. Travel, nevertheless, was arduous, underlining the reality that these were men of affluence and education. London was a frequent point of departure with destinations not only to Italy, but Paris, Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands. Yet it was Italy that remained the essential destination, as so aptly noted by Dr. Johnson. His thoughts were echoed by Charles Thompson in 1744, who declared, Quote, being impatiently desirous of viewing a country so famous in history, which once gave laws to the world, which is at present the greatest school of music and painting, contains the noblest productions of statuary and architecture, and abounds with cabinets of rarities and collections of all kinds of antiquities, close quote. I want to underline the prominent citation of music first in this list of attributes of the Italian peninsula. While Rome and, and Florence were the destination for inspiration, experience, art, and architecture, Naples was giving birth to modern archaeology with the rediscoveries of Herculaneum, Pompeii, and Stabia. Travelers who were prevented from the antiquity of Greece as well as Asia Minor because of Turkish rule flocked to Naples. The British envoy to the Kingdom of Naples, Sir William Hamilton, was an avid collector of antiquity and an ardent student of the yet-to-be-codified field of volcanology. Hamilton embodied the consummate enlightened citizen in bringing together his interest in art, antiquity, and science, authored the collection Campi Flegre, or Flaming Fields, 
documenting the eruptions of Vesuvius, which had destroyed the surrounding ancient cities. Hamilton commissioned the artist Pietro Fabris to create 54 colored plates that illustrated both the volcano and reclamation of Pompeii. This is the excavation of the Temple of Isis, and then uh, uh, an eruption of Vesuvius in 1761. This birth of cultural anthropology was also the context for a new style in music that was first referred to as gallant, and by the initiation of the 19th century described as classic, or the classical period. Numerous contemporary travels noted the phenomenon of music in Naples as they moved into the southern peninsula. Charles de Brosse declared in 1739 that Naples was, quote, the capital of the world's music, close quote. In autumn 1740, Lady Mary Wortley Montague wrote enthusiastically to a friend from Naples that she was, quote, last night at the opera, which is by far the finest in all of Italy, close quote. Finally, the Jesuit and distinguished man of letters, Gabriel Francois Coyer, wrote on his own grand tour, quote, all knowledgeable travelers agree that music gets better and better from Turin to Naples. Naples is its summit. What then did travelers on the Grand Tour find when they arrived in Naples? They were stunned by a city of entertainment at whose core stood the Royal Opera House, the Teatro di San Carlo. De Bros declared in his travelogue, quote, the number and size of the theaters in Italy are a fair mark of that nation's taste for this sort of entertainment. Ordinary cities here have better theaters than those in Paris. The Royal Theater in Naples is of a prodigious size, with seven ranks of loges served by corridors and a deep spacious stage fit for large-scale construction and perspective." Close quote. Yet de Brosse did not even mention the multiple venues for comic opera, innumerable private patrons of instrumental music, and hundreds of churches cultivating sacred forms. At the very foundation of the city were the Neapolitan conservatories, four full-time music schools that educated hundreds of students seeking the distinguished imprimatur of Maestro di Cappella Napoletano, a virtual guarantee of employment on the Italian peninsula and abroad. Their talents were highly valued in the competitive artistic marketplace of Europe and graduates of the Neapolitan schools were compensated on average more than six times more than musicians from elsewhere. These points bring me to our exhibit and the conclusion of my comments. The Grand Tour affected music in many fundamental ways. It broadened the purview and in particular musical tastes of not only the traveler, but also Italian composers and performers. For Italian musicians, they became aware of the potential opportunities beyond the confines of Italy. The travels of Italian musicians were mirror images of the grand tours by their young, affluent, educated social counterparts from the north. Italian musicians increasingly sought both fortune and fame in the, the north, relocating to Paris, Vienna, Berlin, St. Petersburg, London, and beyond. Instead of seeking souvenirs, they exported their talents in the form of original music. Even when they could not travel themselves, their music undertook the journey. Indeed, I encourage you to spend a few minutes with the manuscripts in our <coughs> featured exhibit. The music of Giovanni Battista Pergolesi, above all his comic intermezzo, La Serra Padrona, was performed in Paris in 1752 and initiated the cultural war, the Carrel des Buffons, 16 years after the composer's death. No less than Jean-Jacques Rousseau, after attending a performance of La Serva Padrona, declared the superiority of Italian over French music. And he created in response his own opera, Ludivine du Village. Both works are represented in manuscript in the display. Later in the century, the Carrel was reignited with the arrival of the Italian composer Niccolo Piccini in Paris. You can see one of Piccini's early comedies, Lo Sposo Borlato, as well as his later Didon, written to demonstrate his ability to master French tragedy. There is also a copy of Il Matrimonio Segreto by the great Italian musician Domenico Cimarosa, who, like Pergolesi and Piccini, 
was educated in Naples. Cimarosa's fame as a musician spread across Europe, and he served as resident composer to Catherine the, uh, II in St. Petersburg, producing Matrimonio Segreto, which many scholars believe to be among the greatest comic operas of the 18th century. Finally, there's also on exhibition the first edition of Dr. Charles Burney's The Present State of Music, a contemporary history of music produced after his extended grand tour of Europe of which Italy and Naples were featured prominently. Bernie, the consummate British traveler, was also an astute collector of music and musicians. As documented by his ownership of Michele Maschitti's violin sonatas, music, above all Italian music, played a significant role in the Grand Tour. It transcended the mere status of souvenir. It took the varied forms of art, artist, commodity, and cultural emblem. This morning, we'll hear from my colleague, Professor Guido Oliveri, about a Neapolitan expatriate, Michele Maschitti. Maschitti took his considerable talents and music to Paris in the early 18th century and helped to divine music for violin for the next 50 years. Thank you. So it's my pleasure now to welcome Professor Guido Oliveri, who's senior lecturer in musicology at the University of Texas at Austin. And Professor Oliveri teaches a wide array of classes on early modern Italy. And he's also the director of the UT Early Music Ensemble, dubbed Austinato. I've known Professor Oliveri for more than 20 years, and he's a highly acclaimed and valued scholar who's presented his research nationally and internationally. Um, and had a real impact on reclaiming the legacy of Neapolitan instrumental music in the 18th century. Right now, he's working on a much anticipated long form monograph on Neapolitan instrumental music. He's also recently uncovered an unedited collection of Corelli's violin sonatas, which he's working on for uh, as a critical edition. And he's one of three scholars that have come together to produce the long anticipated critical edition of Il Matrimonio Segreto for the German publisher Berenreiter. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back to Georgetown University, Professor Guido Oliveri. Thank you so much, Professor. Anthony Del Donna for the invitation, and uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here uh, this uh, morning to present uh, about this repertory. Uh, let me get to the. Okay. Here we go. And thank you. Uh, to the library for hosting this event and presenting a, a wonderful exhibition of these rare uh, works and uh, manuscripts and first prints. Uh, we start, we have seen this uh, wonderful uh, uh, overview of the influence and uh, exchanges uh, between uh, Italian repertory and um, other European cultures. Uh, we start this morning uh, with a painting and with some suggestions. We move to Paris, 1720. A small uh, art uh, dealer shop commissioned to a very young uh, but already famous painter a shop sign. And uh, this painter, Antoine Watteau, uh, really represented in this shop sign uh, the new culture that was now uh, taking place in Paris. You see, it's a very elegant, natural uh, description. Uh, groups of people looking at uh, a specific painting, another group of uh, on the right, 
conversing uh, about art, all uh, um, bourgeoisie or uh, uh, young nobles uh, that are in a very uh, galant conversation. And in the foreground, uh, we, have, um, we have the uh, image of a couple, a uh, young gentleman, inviting uh, this lady to enter the shop. Almost we can imagine, right, in a, a very elegant gesture, uh, almost in a, a dance-like gesture that is accompanying this lady uh, at the entrance of the shop. We cannot see the face of this lady. We uh, see the very uh, wonderful silky dress, but we can certainly um, we are captured by the gaze that she's giving to the workers of the shop that are putting aside and packing some old paintings. And one of these old paintings is already in the box and in fact it is the old paintings of Louis XIV. <laughs> so this very uh, small painting, uh, Antoine Bateau, L'Ensemble de Gersant, the Gersant uh, shop sign, is really an, an image, a, a picture of the new climate that uh, was established in Paris after the death of Louis XIV in 1715. Five years later, you find really uh, a new um, climate, a cultural climate, but it is also, uh, Paris is experiencing a change of power, change of culture, social change, and artistic transformation. Uh, the new uh, wealthy financiers, rich merchants, bankiers are really uh, uh, grasping and um, gaining opportunities for social uh, advancement. They are uh, purchasing lands, titles of nobility, and uh, marrying into families of lesser nobility. So uh, they also uh, are establishing a new uh, wealth in, in Paris. And of course, with the advancement of this new group, social group, comes also, the, as a natural consequence, the urge of uh, distinguish themselves from the old regime and embracing some new artistic expression. Uh, in particular, the regent, regent uh, Philippe d'Orléans, who uh, came to the power in 1715, uh, was an uh, amateur uh, performer, but also a strong supporter of the new Italian music. And uh, he actually um, uh, embraced this, this new uh, style. We know that uh, at the very beginning, France um, resisted and opposed the invasion of Italian music, of Italian sonatas. And we know that uh, instead, Philippe d'Orléans was a promoter of this. We, um, we have a, a later um, account that, uh, I quote, uh, says, at the, at the time Corelli published his Opus 5 in 1700, a masterpiece of the art, Monsieur the Duc d'Orléans, uh, later regent of the realm, being extremely curious about music, wanted to hear these sonatas, but he could not find at that time any violinist in Paris able to perform chords and was forced to have them sung by three voices. You can imagine <laughs> sonatas by Corelli performed vocally. The scarcity of violinists, however, did not last long. And in fact, uh, in the early decade uh, of, the, of the 18th century, we start to see uh, musicians coming to uh, France, to Paris, with uh, sonatas 
and cantadas of the Italian style. In 1701, Sébastien de Brossard, uh, in his Dictionnaire de Musique, states, uh, never has there been more test, taste and passion for Italian music than exists now in France. And uh, a few years later, the newspaper the, um, Mercure de France commented, cantadas and sonadas spring right out of the ground here in Paris. <laughs> no musician arrives without a sonata or cantata in his pocket. There isn't a soul who does not want to compose his own set to be engraved and so outsmart the Italians on their own ground. So it became really a um, a la mode to perform and to listen to this music, to this Italian uh, music. So that the, the querelle that uh, we, we heard before, uh, Professor Del, uh, um, Del Donna was referring to, the querelle du Buffon in 1752, was in fact preceded by this strong contrast and fight. On one side, the champions of French music, the national tradition represented up to 1715 by the king, the absolute power of the king. And on the other side, the champions of Italian music that was not only a new style, but also represented a new approach, uh, political, social, new approach to power of this emerging social class. Some of the uh, performers and musicians that arrived in Paris in the early 18th century were in fact uh, supported by Philippe d'Orléans and by other aristocrats in, uh, in the city. And um, if we look at the names, uh, we find several of them coming, in fact, from Naples. It's not surprising for a, a series of reasons. One of, of them was, in fact, the great um, tradition of the School of Music in, in, uh, in Naples, the four conservatories that produced this large uh, amount, really, of talents that established their fame then in other courts of Europe. But it's uh, really interesting that three violinists, in particular, uh, arrived in, in Paris in, um, right before 1710, Giovanni Antonio Guido, Giovanni Antonio Piani, and Michele Mascitti. Mascitti was among the first to uh, arrive actually in the Paris capital. Um, he uh, was born uh, in a small town in the Abruzzi actually, not in Naples, but uh, Villa Santa Maria near Chieti, near the modern Chieti, uh, is a place that um, is nowadays fam famous for uh, uh, cook and cooking, <laughs> but at that time actually uh, produced some of the best musicians that, of course, being Villa Santa Maria, a small town and very poor, moved to the big city, the capital of the reign, Naples, to uh, study in, the, in one of the four conservatories. And uh, Mascitti had another uh, reason for moving to Naples. He was the nephew of the first violin of the uh, Royal Chapel in Naples, uh, Pietro Marchitelli. Pietro Marchitelli was really uh, one of the most important musicians and talented violinists in Naples who helped Mascitti and several other uh, nephews actually to establish their fame in, uh, in Naples. So Mascitti probably worked, uh, started studying with, uh, with Marchitelli. He, he then, uh, we, we don't know much about his early activity in Naples. Uh, he probably studied also in one of the conservatories. We know that uh, at the end of the 17th century, we have a few documents that attests um, his activity in Naples in 1697-98 uh, with Francesco Provenzale and other um, the, the master, uh, the maestro di cappella of the royal uh, chapel in Naples. And um, so he was very active in Naples at that time. But uh, at a certain point moved 
to Paris. We don't know exactly when uh, he moved from Naples to Paris. There is a lot of, um, there are various uh, accounts and, and there is a little bit of uh, uh, legendary and mythology about his, his travel. Some say that he traveled throughout Europe and performed throughout Europe before arriving in Paris. But uh, I have discovered uh, re recently a document that actually in, in 1702 he was still probably in Naples because he um, drafted a, a, um, an agreement with his uncle, Pietro Marchitelli, leaving all uh, the, the possessions to Pietro Marchitelli as to, to control all uh, of Maschitti's um, possessions in Naples. So it means that probably in 1702 he decided to move to uh, mm. Paris. What we know for sure is that sometimes around 1704, he was already um, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, so less than two years later, uh, Maschitti had arrived in, uh, in Paris and uh, Mercure Galant actually announced his presence uh, in the city. Uh, we can, perhaps we will have time later for some questions. Uh, the, the timing of his move to Paris is very um, uh, indicative because 1702 is actually a turning point, a crucial point in uh, the Neapolitan history and particularly for the uh, instrumental, for the history of instrumental music. In 1702, uh, Naples was controlled by uh, the King of Spain, but the King of Spain at that point was Philip V uh, of Bourbon. So he was part of the French influence and uh, Naples entered in the uh, sphere of influence of Paris, as well as 1702 marks the presence in Naples of Arcangelo Corelli that we have listened to before. And so it's a very important, crucial moment of uh, change in Naples. And that's probably why uh, Maschitti sorry, uh, moved to Paris a couple of years later, around that time. The Mercure Galant, the, the local um, newspaper, announced um, the publication of Maschitti's Opus First, a collection of sonatas that um, were actually dedicated, uh, this is the original, of course, of the, of the announcement, were dedicated to the Duke d'Orléans. The composer of this work has acquired a considerable reputation since he has been in Paris. He has had the good fortune of pleasing the great prince whom I have just named, the Duke d'Orléans, and who is never deceived about worthy person. Uh, Monsieur Machitti has had the honor of playing for the king, for Monsieur the Dauphin, and therefore for the whole court, who applauded him strongly. And then we have this little note. The strong sales of this book, of which hardly any copies are still available, show its good quality. <laughs> and that's a very uh, important note because uh, it shows how Maschitti, first of all, was in the city, uh, had arrived in, uh, in uh, Paris already from a few months. He had already performed some of this music for the Duke d'Orléans, who probably supported financially, of course, the publication of this Opus One. But even more important, uh, this announcement tells us that uh, Maschitti's Opus One was selling very well in Paris and that the copies were not any, any longer available to the, to the uh, public. So we have an immediate success of Maschitti and of his music in uh, Paris. Uh, a, a, a wonderful success that was, uh, of course, um, in part due to the dedication of uh, the works to uh, the Altezza Reale, the Duke d'Orléans, this is the original dedication. As you can notice, it is in Italian. 
And uh, Mashiti um, uh, thanks, of course, the support for this publication. Your, Rola, your Royal Highness, it would be much too daring to present this first fruit of my music to a prince of such high understanding in all kinds of disciplines as your Royal Highness certainly is, were it not that you himself deem it worthwhile to show some satisfaction in listening to me. Again, he had performed for the Duke d'Orléans. Having been encouraged by such a conspicuous favor and in order to express an humble gratitude rather than to present an offering worthy of your Royal Highness, I dedicate to your august name this sonata of mine, which can be said to be most fortunate if Together with their author, they obtained such an authoritative patronage and coveted approval. So, um, under the protection and uh, support of the Duc d'Orléans, Maschetti started the publication of his music. The success of this music uh, is actually testimonied by the presence of several copies of this Opus One several that were even stolen by other publishers outside of France. And in fact, you have an example of this in the <laughs> exhibition. Uh, it's, a, it's a copy made by uh, John Walsh, who was the most important English uh, printer and publisher, who actually took uh, some of the French uh, publications and reprinted them uh, in, uh, in England. And that is, of course, the, the copy that was in possession of the historian Charles Burney. But this demonstrates, once again, the popularity of uh, Italian music and of Maschitti's music in particular in France and elsewhere in Europe. Why this popularity? <coughs> well, of course, as I said, political, social factors uh, were, were in place. But in the case of Maschitti, of course, there was also a um, very close um, imitation, we can say, of Corelli's music. Uh, in the afternoon, we will hear uh, a wonderful con con concert uh, presenting Arcangelo's, uh, Arcangelo Corelli's sonatas, as well as some examples of uh, Maschitti's sonatas. And I'm sure you will, uh, I don't want to spoil the surprise, <laughs> so I will not play any music of, of this composer, but you will immediately recognize the similarity of style between these two composers. Because actually Maschitti um, proclaimed him himself a student of Corelli, we are not very sure about the fact that he actually studied <laughs> under Corelli, but it was a very clever move because Corelli's music was uh, popular in Paris as well as in all, all over Europe, as, as we have seen. And uh, he capitalized on the popularity of Corelli's music to have his sonatas uh, published and uh, widespread. This similarity, it's actually showed even in, it, it was intentional. It is showed even in the frontispiece of these sonatas. Uh, a comparison between the, the uh, depiction, right, of the frontispiece of Maschitti's Opus 1 on your left and Corelli's Opus 5, the most important, most famous and popular collection of sonatas by Corelli, shows you that Maschitti did not, nothing to conceal his, <laughs> uh, you know, his uh, uh, imitation and uh, his consideration of Corelli's uh, music as a model. Um, in the wake of, commercial, of the commercial success of Opus One, Maschitti published actually two other uh, collections of sonatas. Uh, in uh, 1706, uh, 15 new solo sonatas were printed chez Foucault in Paris, and um, the next year, 1707, 12 more uh, sonatas were published. This is actually a, a very remarkable uh, feat. Uh, a single composer 
uh, publishing already in the turn of you know a few years three full set of sonatas and, and having them printed. But the most important, more, most remarkable um, element of this is actually uh, the information that is contained in the advertisement of the Opus 2, where Mashiti addresses directly the public and underlines once more the reputation that his works has uh, attained. But this is in French this time. That's a very important change, right? The success of my first works, says Mashiti, has been more favorable than I should have dared to hope. The refinement of the French public had given me a fair amount of apprehension, and in spite of the care that I had taken to please it, I did fear that it would not receive them favorably. Consequently, it is out of gratitude that I take the liberty of presenting a new collection. I have found such beautiful things in French music that I have tried diligently to reconcile them with the Italian taste in some of my sonatas. Now, this is probably more a commercial uh, <laughs> uh, advertisement. We don't know, really looking at these sonatas, how much French style and French uh, elements are present in uh, in these sonatas. It, they sound pretty much um, uh, Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an important <laughs> element that he is underlining at least the intention of putting together the two traditions, the Italian and the French, uh, unifying them in a new style that actually will become the galant style in which the Italian music had a very strong um, component and influence. But even more important, this is the evidence that Mashiti is not dedicating Opus 2 and Opus 3 to any patron, meaning he is not receiving financial support from any of the nobles or aristocratic families of the time. That is probably due to the fact that his selling was going so well that he could survive out of the money he received from that. This is an extremely rare and very modern approach to uh, music making in 18th century. Uh, Mashiti was probably, to my knowledge, one of the two, perhaps three, musicians able to really be freelance musicians in uh, uh, 18th century Europe. Uh, so we don't have any indication that he held a regular position in Paris and not even a continuing patronage of, of his music. And this means also that Paris was the perfect place because uh, there is in Paris an increasing commercialization of music, an early manifestation of the, uh, what has been called the public sphere, the presence of and the notion of music and art as a commodity that functioned as social promotion and could sell in, uh, in uh, <coughs> Paris. The public, the audience, made the fortune of Michele Maschitti in Paris. Um, we have the popularity of uh, Maschitti's works uh, continued for uh, the entire 18th century. Um, in, uh, later in the century, we have uh, Hubert Leblanc, this is 1740, that states, one never tires of replaying the second and third books of M uh, Monsieur Michel, uh, wonderful sonatas, that um, in comparison to some pieces uh, are far removed from degenerating to the tri triviality of the tunes. And uh, he also says, Monsieur Blavé, a famous uh, flute player, took for a starting point the admirable composition by Monsieur Michel, the second sonata of his second book. Um, in the following uh, opus uh, and, and publications, the opus four, 1711, still very close to the, to the other. Uh, Mashiti uh, once again uh, dedicated instead uh, this, this collection to the um, 
Altezza elettorale to, to uh, Maximilian II, Emmanuel, elector of Bavaria, who was spending some time in, uh, um, in, pa in Paris during the 1709 1711. And uh, in the following one, Opus 5, he actually um, saw the, the, um, uh, the patronage and support of a figure that uh, has been also uh, named before, Cardinal Pietro Ottoboni, one of the most influential um, patrons of art and music in Rome, but also uh, a cardinal who had connections with Paris. Uh, he was, the, by the way, the patron of Corelli and of Scarlatti, and the publication of Opus V happened by, by Mashiti happened where, where uh, th this collection was published in 1714. Very good timing because in 1713 Corelli had died. So we guess that Mashiti as a student of Corelli was trying to uh, perhaps <laughs> getting a position, getting a job in Rome with Cardinal Otto Boni. Um, by the first quarter of the 18th century, Maschitti's music had clearly become part of the repertory and was performed in the numerous musical events that took place in Paris. Uh, again, the following two publications, Opus 6 and Opus 7, that were uh, uh, published in 1722-1727 respectively, had no uh, dedication. But this collection, Op Opus 7, uh, is particularly important because it contains not only sonatas for violin, but also four concerti for uh, uh, two violins and bass for the concertino and uh, the other instruments for the ripieno. So four concerti grossi, that's the definition of this uh, structure, of this form, right? And those were actually the first concerti to be published in Paris. Mm. So Maschitti at this point is really dominating the production of instrumental music in Paris at that time. And he is participating to the other important aspect that by the 1720s uh, is enriching the musical life in Paris. In 1724, the Concert Italien was established. It was a concert series where uh, were presented sonatas, concerti, uh, um, some arias. They were public concert series, the first among the earliest concert series in Europe. And a year later, in 1725, an even larger concert series, the Concert Spirituel, were established. And these were actually, some of these were supported by a family of uh, financiers that was dominating Paris at that time, the Crozat family. Uh, Pierre and Antoine Crozat were uh, among the richest people in, uh, uh, in Paris. Actually, Pierre was the younger brother, was called the poor Crozat, uh, <laughs> because Antoine, his <coughs> older brother, uh, had received actually the, um, the control of uh, Louisiana uh, by, the, by the king, the, the commercial uh, exchange with Louisiana. And so it was really one of the richest men in Paris. So this is the, the poor uh, of the family. And Crozat actually uh, invited uh, regularly, once a week, uh, intellectuals and musicians at his own apartments in Rue de Richelieu in Paris, organizing concerts in his, in his um, house. And... Um, he was also the patron of Antoine Watteau. Under his support, financial support, Watteau created the 
conversation galante, the galante conversations, dialogues, that is uh, a set of little paintings that reflects really the new cultural, social, and uh, artistic um, uh, trend that was present in uh, Paris. So it is not by chance that uh, Maschitti dedicated the last two set that he published, Opus 8 and Opus 9. So imagine a composer that in the uh, turn of, of less than 30 years has published nine collections of instrumental music in Paris, one of the most successful, really, musician. And Opus 8 and 9 are, in fact, dedicated to the uh, family, the Crozat family. Opus 8 to, the, um, uh, to Marie Marguerite, the wife of Antoine Crozat, and then Opus 9 to the um, family in general, to the sons of, uh, of Crozat. Uh, he actually was welcomed and hosted in uh, Crozat's apartments. And he died, apparently, in 1760, Maschitti, in the apartment of, in Rue de Richelieu, in the uh, Crozat's apartments, at the age of 96. This is, the, this is the document that we have. We don't know if uh, that's accurate, but it's very likely that he was very um, uh, advanced in his uh, years. And um, I want to conclude with this uh, uh, quotation from <coughs> Titan Dutillier. When he, uh, Titan Dutillier was asked to put together Le Parnasse Francais, Francais in 1732, uh, the best uh, description of the um, greatest artists and musicians of the uh, time of Louis XIV, he uh, quotes explicitly the Neapolitan composers and musicians. I must admit also that I have never heard of good Italian music before that of Corelli. <laughs> the pleasure that French took in Italian music around the beginning of the 18th century encouraged many skilled musicians from Italy who excelled in playing the violin to move to Paris. I should say from Italy, yes, but from Naples because Three, at least, if not all four of the names that are included in this list are, in fact, from Naples. Among others, Giovanni Antonio Guido, who was at the service of Monsieur the Duc d'Orléans, Desplan, Giovanni Antonio Piani, or Monsieur le Comte de Toulouse, Mi Michel, Michele Maschitti, in fact, who Monsieur de Crozat, great, great amateur of Italian music, received in his home. It was for them that the musicians of the two nations, very happy with each other, were pleased to establish a nice relationship between them. It is from that time that Italian music has been so strongly appreciated and has become so familiar in France. Thank you. is, of course, Arcangelo Corelli, the greatest uh, violinist and composer of the 18th century, who was really a model for uh, all the, uh, the musicians of the century, especially for uh, instrumental music, sonatas, 
in particular. So um, I've talked about uh, Mashiti quite a bit. Uh, you will listen to these two uh, sonatas um, taken from uh, two different collections. And you will notice, as we have discussed this morning, how Mashiti looks at the model of Corelli, but he elaborates it in a more, uh, uh, in a style that is closer to the French taste, and um, in order to sell better, but also because he, he, he was really interested in blending the two traditions. But we have also, uh, going a little bit back to the late 17th century, a sonata for uh, violoncello and basso by Alessandro Scarlatti. Alessandro Scarlatti, a Sicilian, but uh, formed in Rome and worked in Rome, but in 1684 came to Naples and established for many um, scholars and historians, they say that he really opened up the possibilities of the new Neapolitan school and established this Neapolitan school. And it's particularly um, important, interesting and important uh, to have here a sonata for violoncello because the violoncello, not only the violin, but also the violoncello, had at the beginning of the 18th century a very strong uh, tradition with uh, virtuosi that started from Naples and um, did their, their career and pursued their career in other European centers. And then we have the, uh, an image of the continuity of this uh, tradition, looking at the mid and second half of the 18th century with two composers that are mostly known for being operatic composer, Leonardo Leo and Nicola Porpora, some of the uh, most important uh, creators of and composers of operas. But here we have an example of how these composers were also gifted in uh, writing instrumental music. And we should not forget that Nicola Porpora was actually the teacher of Haydn. And so this continuity of the wonderful, uh, the brilliant uh, school, instrumental school that was founded and created in a sense in Naples, uh, goes, uh, some elements of it at least, arrive up to Haydn and further. So I stop here because I really look forward to listen to this concert. I hope you enjoy. Thank you.
last Mashiti is something that's actually in the Georgetown Library collection. I think it says that in your program. But very interestingly, it was formerly in the collection of Charles Burney, who was a very um, important, sometimes people consider him the founder of musicology. So he's an English uh, lover of music who traveled around Europe and wrote about what he heard and collected music. So this, the actual thing we're reading from is a photograph of what's in the library. So
before we play this, I'll just probably have to see, but it's just interesting seeing, I guess it's Scarlatti manuscript or a copy, I'm not sure. But it, um, it's just interesting seeing probably something he wrote hastily, maybe for a friend or something like that. But it has a real, like, uh, spontaneous look to it.
as Professor Olivieri mentioned before, and uh, Mashiti worked in Paris. So he's one of the, to my knowledge, one of the few Italian composers who actually assimilated some French style elements, or at least some French taste into some of his music. And I think you hear that maybe even a little bit more in this trio than in the violin sonata. So um, some of the, like, the opening almost is like a, uh, an over French overture in some ways. And, uh, the kinds of, some of the kinds of little ornamental things he puts in. It's French.
you have questions for us afterwards, please feel free to come up and have questions about the music or the instruments or whatever. Thank <laughs> you.